Okay, well, let's get started. It is the 16th of June. I can't believe we're halfway through this month already. Uh, we have a busy week ahead of us between uh, the lab exam on Wednesday and talking about bones and muscles and joints this week in lecture. Let's take a look at the syllabus. Uh, syllabus tells us that we have an exam next Monday. That exam will cover the two presentations I'll be giving this week. And those presentations will be over bones and muscles and joints. Same, same kinds of things that you're rehearsing right now for the lab exam we'll be discussing here. The vocab on that exam is going to be 41 through 50. Okay, so only I'm going to give you five uh, term slides today and five slides on third or Wednesday. So there aren't that many vocabulary terms on this exam. And then um, we'll be working through chapter... Um, the chapter on the skeletal system, then the chapter on the joints, and then finally on the muscles. Now, if you look at your syllabus, it looks really, really scary because it says there's like five chapters on this exam, right? In reality, it's two lectures. And uh, two of those chapters I don't, I don't lecture on because one of the chapters is name that bone and one of the chapters is name that muscle. So I'm not going to sit here and go through all that with you. You've been through that in lab. So it really brings us down to a chapter on the skeleton, a chapter, a little bit of information on the joints, some selected content about joints, and then also a few slides and a little bit of conversation about muscle on Wednesday. So all of that is coming at you this week. Now, honestly, during the regular semester, the lab exam and this exam always come on the same day or they come in the same couple of days. So you're having the lab exam one week and the lecture exam the following week is actually kind of nice. And you've got it a little bit more spread out. So I know it seems like a lot, and I'm not going to sit here and try to suggest that it isn't a lot of material, but I know that you can do this. Uh, so let's get going on vocab, uh, 41 through 46 right now. I also want to put a quick commercial in on the short paper. I've been remiss in mentioning the short paper. On Blackboard, under assignments, you'll see a one-page Word document that gives you the requirements for the short paper. Let me give you the highlights of that. Then I'll have you read through that, and I probably am going to extend the due date on that because I have not given you sufficient time. So right now, the short paper is due on the 20... Due on the 30th of June. I'll put that out a couple weeks. It's not a big deal to me. So let's put that out until, now no matter where I put it, it's going to conflict with something, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm putting it out two weeks further to make it easier for you to get it done. But keep in mind, you don't want to wait till the night before of my new due date to start it. But let's put it out to, what's two weeks later? Let's put it out until the, I'll put it out to the, the 15th, the 16th, okay? The 16th. Um, and it's just, it's, it, you can give it to me any time between now and the 16th of July. So it's giving you a whole month, okay, to get this assignment done. Now, here's the deal with the short paper. It sounds kind of scary. It's four paragraphs long. And this assignment is an opportunity for you to go to the library and to do some legitimate research on a topic of your choice. doesn't matter what the topic is as long as it's related to the human body. It could be a new medication, a procedure, a, a medical condition, a genetic syndrome, anything that you've heard about and that you want to learn more about. Maybe an aunt has been diagnosed with something. Uh, yourself, you're dealing with something you want to learn more about. Choose that as your topic. Whatever it is you're choosing, you're excited about, so you spend more time learning something of value to you. You're going to find three articles, three research articles or three papers about that topic. The first article, and this is all very clearly laid out, but the very first paper is it does not, it does not uh, matter how long the paper is. It doesn't matter um, if it comes from a scientific journal or not. It could be coming from the newspaper, from an internet article. It could come from anywhere. And it's on that topic. I would call this the layman's paper. So it's going to be written in very common language. Okay. The second and the third articles that you will find related to your topic are going to be stout research articles. Articles you're not going to find usually just by going to Google and typing in your topic. These are going to require some library research, and you're going to go to the library databases to do this. The librarians upstairs are very much aware of this assignment. They'll help you with it. Uh, the, the, my requirements of a research paper include 
Number one, that the paper has an author. Number two, that it's at least three pages long in its original form. And number three, that it has references to other works at the end. So this is a true research article. There's an author to it. It's at least three pages long. And at the end, they're referencing other works that they referred to while they were writing their paper. Okay, So that's my definition of a peer-reviewed or research article. The first article, I don't care if it has an author or not. I don't care if it's three pages long. And I don't care if it has references to other works or not. So the first article is very, very open. It can be something very short. It could be the prescription form that, you, you know, if you're taking a medication, you get that, that folded out form. It could be that. It could be something from Reader's Digest from Health, uh, Fox News Health or CNNHealth.com. It doesn't matter what the first article is. The fourth, are the, and for each of the three papers, you write one paragraph. I learned from this, from this X, Y, and Z. So you just kind of close your eyes and type. I'm not looking for in-text in citations. I'm not looking for a formal research paper. I want to know that you are able to read the literature and glean from it an a paragraph worth of information. The fourth paragraph is simply, why did you choose it? I chose this topic because. Give me a reasonable answer as to why you chose this topic. That's it, four paragraphs. At the end, you'll give me the citations for all three articles. So I want proper, I don't care if it's APA or MLA, but a proper citation, you know, author, journal, year, pages, the whole bit for your three citations. On the bottom of the paper, I give you a, cite, uh, a website you can go to that will help you with your citations if you're not sure how to do those citations. Again, the librarians are a wonderful help for this. They're very much aware of this assignment. So I'll give you a month to do that assignment. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. I don't think after reading through it, you'll have any trouble. This assignment is worth 50 points, I believe, and your overall points. That's 5% of your grade. It's a really nice little grade to go into your uh, point, into your point uh, total. And the only people who don't make full credit on this are the ones who simply don't read the instructions. So make sure you read the instructions that you do everything I'm asking you to do. If you have any questions at all, email me or let me know. And I'd be glad to clarify it for you. OK, so that's the short paper. Four paragraphs, you'll attach your, your four paragraphs, you'll attach your three articles, and you'll give that to me by no later than July 16th. And you will also upload your four paragraphs to Safe Aside. And on Blackboard, you'll see a little green check mark. You'll click on that, and it will give you instructions on how to upload the body of your four paragraphs to an anti plagiarism tool. And this is the way that I know that you have not plagiarized or copied from someone's previous semester's work. Um, and if you are repeating the class with me, uh, I've had people turn in the same assignment again. Oh, no, that's 100% plagiarized from last semester. So make sure that you redo the assignment if you are, in fact, repeating the course. Any thoughts or questions on the short paper? It really isn't very long, right? Short paper, four paragraphs. OK, uh, 50 points. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on that. Read through it. If you want to wait, obviously you have a month. So if you don't even want to look at that this week, I get it. Next week, take a look at the requirements and then start talking to me about it. Vocabulary 41 through 50. So let's start with 41, holo. We've seen holocrine secretion. Remember, that was uh, where the whole cell was disintegrating when sebaceous glands released their products. Um, so anything with whole or entire. Homo and homeo, both meaning the same, although there's a slight difference here. We don't, we say homeostasis, don't we? We don't say homostasis. And there is a slight difference in the meanings, although I have them both here as same. Um, homeostasis, we know that our blood pressure stays within a range. It doesn't stay exactly the same, right? It doesn't stay a flat line. It stays within a range, whereas homo means exactly the same. So if it were homostasis, then our blood pressure would never fluctuate. Our blood pressure would never fluctuate at all. Hylo, we've seen hyaline cartilage. You know that this is a clear, glassy-looking cartilage, so it has... Uh, that meaning, transparent, glassy, or clear. Hydro, water. Iatrix. Oops, I skipped one, didn't I? So hyper, these are very familiar ones. Hopefully you'll see these a lot. Hyper meaning above or over. Hypertrophy, to grow over, to grow uh, more of something. Hypo, under or below. Hypodermal needle, underneath the dermis, underneath the skin. If it ends in IA, some sort of state or condition, hypoglycemia, a state of hypo, low, glyco, sugar, of the blood, emia. 
right? So a condition of the blood where there's low blood sugar, hypo, a hypo, hypoglycemia. Um, and then IATR, if you see that in a word like pediatrics or in podiatry, you'll see that IATR root, meaning some sort of treatment or medical specialty. IASIS, an abnormal condition. And then IATRI, again, we're back to some sort of medical treatment like psychiatry. If it ends in ick pertaining to, we've also had AC and AL, right? EEL, right? AC and EEL and now ick, all meaning pertaining to. Idio, self or distinct. If you are told that you have an idiopathic condition, it means that it's so unusual, so distinct, so of just you that we really don't know what's going on. So we'll call it an idiopathic condition. We don't know really what's going on. Uh, unknown cause. If an, a term ends in IN, it's oftentimes a very good clue that it's a protein. So hemoglobin, as an example, ending in IN. Infra below. There's a muscle called the infraspinatus, uh, and uh, we'll see that when we get to the rotator cuff muscles next semester. Intervertebral foramen, right, between. So inter meaning between. So intercollegiate sports, playing between different colleges. Intervertebral foramen, interosseous, between bones. Intra, within. Intracellular, within the cell. Iris, you have a rainbow colored or a, a colored muscle of your eye called the iris. Iris means rainbow. Ism, a condition or state of something. Rheumatism is a state of inflammation of connective tissues. Isthmus, the greatest. Latissimus, the greatest, broadest muscle, right? Latissimus of the side and then dorsi of the back. Iso, equal or same. Isotonic, remember that? The equal tonicity. And I'll go all the way to 46 today. Ite, little. So we'll see in a couple of weeks a term called dendrites, little tree-like structures found in neurons. Itis, an inflammation of something. M and N, both being negating terms, meaning not. And finally, immunoresistant. Uh, immunology, the study of how your body fights off infection and becomes resistant to invading bodies. So that is half of it. We'll go only through LUCO. Okay, so LUCO will be the last bit of this vocab, just a very limited amount of vocab, uh, 41 through 50 for next Monday. It's on two slides, right? No, it's not on 50. It's not on 50? So what do you have through 50? Through what? Let. Okay, I'll go on your list. I'll go on your list, okay? So no, no Luco in yours, just through let. Okay, now this is actually for you, Chapter 6, right? Our numbers are off from the other book, yeah. Is that new PAL quiz that you added to... Mm -hmm. One of the two that are in the syllabus. That yes, the absolutely. Yep, it's a ten-point quiz. It's been in your syllabus. Absolutely. So you'll find a fifty-question quiz. Um, it's got histology. It's got bones, bone markings, and muscles. It's there again to help you get prepared for the lab exam. So now you've got two things to do in preparation of the lab exam. In addition to just studying, you've got that lab quiz that you'll bring to me. Uh, it's posted in the hallway. Those who have lab tonight, you'll be introduced to that. And you'll bring that to me at the lab exam. And you also have online uh, a mastering quiz. You'll see it. It's due. It says that it's due Wednesday evening at 6.30. But if you're taking the lab exam in the afternoon, it is to be done before you take the lab exam at 2. The point of it is to practice, right, and be even more prepared for the lab exam. So on there, it's just click, 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 name that bone marking. It's open book. You should do well on it so you can have your notes open. But again, it's another opportunity to master the material. So that's a 10-point quiz. You've got your uh, lab quiz six. That's a five-point quiz. So these are both open book assignments, and you should do really well on them. Other questions? When will the answers form be available so we can see how well we did? They won't be. Oh, okay. the, the one for, well, they're both open book. So there's no reason not to do really, really well. OK. Um, so mm -hmm. they won't be available because there'll be people taking it after you. So they won't be available online, because then the key would be available to those who had not yet taken it. 
Okay, so again, this is chapter six for you uh, on the skeletal system. And we know some of this. I mean, we know quite a bit of this, actually. We've talked about bones. We know what bone looks like under the microscope. We, we, we know uh, a lot of bones, and we can name quite a few bone markings. So hopefully this is largely review, perhaps not completely review, but largely review as, you, as we move through this conversation today. So I haven't been to this particular church in Prague, but apparently uh, during the dark ages, there were so many bones, they didn't know what to do with them all, so they built churches out of them. So this church has chandeliers with human ribs, and you can see the skulls that are decorating the ceiling. Um, a little bit gruesome, but perhaps uh, beautiful in its own way. So let's talk about the skeletal system. I think I've got you convinced, if you didn't already know it, that the skeletal system is not just a bunch of sticks, right, that hold us together, that our muscles move around and give us st structure or support. But in fact, our skeletal system is a very dynamic system, interacting with other systems. We'll learn in 106 there are actually hormones made by your bones that are released into your bloodstream and affect your brain and affect your metabolism. So there's a lot going on in our bones that we're learning more and more about all the time. So we know that bones are mostly, if I, think, if I hand you a femur, you know that the bone is mostly, quote, bone, and you know that bone is a connective tissue. But within that bone, you're also going to find some smooth muscle. You're going to find smooth muscle around all the blood vessels. Anywhere where there's a blood vessel, there's going to be smooth muscle around that blood vessel. So sure enough, within bones, where there, you know there's a lot of blood vessels, there'll be some smooth muscle represented there. And there would definitely be some nervous tissue. Recall that going through the central canals, there are nerves as well as blood vessels. So bone is very innervated, highly, uh, lots of nerve activity. And then there would also be epithelial uh, layers. Again, around the outside of the bone, there's a periosteal layer lining your blood vessels. Not only are there smooth muscle cells, but there's also epithelial tissue. So I'm back to the idea that a bone is, a, is an organ. Right? If I hand you a femur, it really is an organ, and that organ is made up of representative tissues. Right? There's going to be some connective tissue, some muscle, some nervous, and some epithelial tissue making up that bone. Now, as I mentioned, the skeletal system and the bones are interacting with other systems, and your bones are not just these static sticks. They're constantly being remodeled, and we'll discuss that today. Not only are we dealing with the bones, but we're also dealing with the cartilage, the ligaments, and the other structures that help to stabilize the bones. And they're all considered part of the skeletal system. These bones are supporting our weight and work with our muscular system to prov provide movement. But we also don't want to forget that our bones are storing huge amounts of calcium and phosphates for us. And uh, the importance of that calcium will be really highlighted next semester when we talk about uh, nerve impulses and we talk about muscle contraction and we'll see how important calcium is to the overall body's metabolism and we don't want to ever forget that within our bones we're making our blood so the process of hematopoiesis sometimes just called hemopoiesis is occurring within our bone marrow so a pretty important system we'll start with a few obvious things that the bones are there to provide support, we get that. And we can name bones that protect organs. For example, the ribs are going to protect the heart, right, and the lungs, easily enough. The, the pelvis, the oscoxa, are going to be uh, providing protection to the reproductive organs and to the, and to the bladder. And the spinal cord is protected by the vertebra, the brain, by the skull. We get it, right, that there are lots of bones that are not only providing structure, but also protection to our internal organs. We've also got movement, we got that, and we have hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis, the production of bone or blood cells. Hemopoiesis is occurring in the red bone marrow. Now you know from lab there's both red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is not actively hemopoietic, so it's mostly just fat. The red bone marrow is actively making these blood cells. And, um, but remember, it's not just red blood cells that are being made there. It's also your white blood cells and your platelets, something important for blood clotting, are all being made in your bones. Where you are still making blood as an adult, you're still making blood largely in your flat bones. I'll describe bones in different shapes in a moment. Flat bones would be 
even though they're, they're rounded, if you will, but if you were to take your fingers and go around your frontal bone, it's rather flat. So your frontal bone, your skull bones, your ribs, your sternum are largely hematopoietic still. You'll also find uh, blood production in your vertebra and in your uh, oscoxa and at the proximal ends of both your humerus and your femur. So that's where you still have active red bone marrow. Everything else, the center would be yellow bone marrow. I've already mentioned uh, calcium as being an important mineral. Uh, calcium is necessary for your muscles to contract. It's necessary for your blood to clot. It's necessary for your uh, nerve impulses to travel throughout your body. You'll be seeing calcium a lot next semester. So just say for now that um, when the body needs calcium, it gets it, and it, it robs it or takes it from our bones, and there's this constant remodeling and rebuilding of our bones that allow for this. And phosphate, right, you've heard about ATP. Uh, we haven't talked about it too much, but um, this is a molecule with phosphates in it. That's what the P is. Uh, recall that DNA has a phosphate sugar backbone. So a lot of phosphate in DNA. So we clearly have seen model, uh, molecules along the way that have calcium and phosphate that are very, very important. Let's start off by talking about cartilage. Some of this you know. You know that it's a semi-solid or a semi-rigid connective tissue. You know that it is made by, well, the cells that I've said so far are chondrocytes. And that's correct. Chondrocytes are the cells that we see in cartilage. However, the cells that actively made the cartilage are instead called chondroblasts. Remember from a vocabulary, blast means to germinate or bud from. So the cells that are actively building new cartilage and are making the extracellular matrix around the cells are called chondroblasts. Now, once those chondroblasts build the matrix around them, then they kind of go into a semi-retirement state. They're not quite as metabolically active, and we change their name to chondrocytes. The chondrocytes are the cells embedded within the lacuna. So we'll see this blast and site story continue on in the bone as well. Recall that mature cartilage is avascular. There's no blood flow going through mature cartilage, telling us that the cells, these chondrocytes, must get their nutrients from some nearby tissue and must get it through the process of diffusion. Cartilage, hard but not as hard as bone. Primary functions include supporting some of your softer tissues, think your ear, your nose, uh, providing a gliding surface or an articulation for your joints. So wherever two bones come together, you'll see a nice glistening layer of cartilage. We don't see that upstairs in the lab because these bones are just, quote, bones, but if they were freshly harvested bones, we would see that beautiful layer of white cartilage on each of the articulating ends of the bones. And then finally, um, your skeleton was at one point mostly cartilage. It was specifically hyaline cartilage, and your bones were formed first from a rough draft made of cartilage. If you've been in lab, you've seen this third term. Um, otherwise, or for night, you'll see it. Tendons, we know, are connectors that connect muscle to bone. All right, so tendons are connective tissue, if you will, almost like a rope that connects a muscle to a bone. Remind me, what kind of tissue makes up a tendon? More, more correctly, tendons are composed of dense, regular connective tissue. Remember, dense, regular connective tissue was on our slides in the lab. It actually was called white fibrous tissue, if you read the, the, the scope slide. And the reason was white because it's pretty much, not completely, but mostly avascular. Very little blood flow in tendon. So if you look in the models on the, in the room, you'll see tendons are always white, you know, almost pure white. Very little blood flow and lots of collagen creating strength for these tendons. Now, the same stuff uh, is called a ligament if it connects a bone to a bone. Okay, it's still dense, regular connective tissue. And then if this uh, tendon-like material is not more like a cord, but more like a flattened sheet, 
it's referred to as an aponeurosis. And an aponeurosis connects muscle to muscle. And you'll see some of those in the lab. Now, bones can be classified, grouped by shape. In lab, we talked about the long bone anatomy, the diaphysis, the epiphyses, the nutrient foramen, the bone marrow. You've seen that. And long bones would be bones like the humerus, the femur, uh, the radius, the tibia, but also your phalanges, right? Even the little tiny bones of your fingers are just miniature versions, right, of a long bone, taller than they are wide. Other bones are short bones. Your short bones are pretty much your wrist bones, your carpals, some of your tarsals, your ankle bones, um, and your patella is considered a short bone. They're, they're kind of cubic, right? Not too wide, not much taller than they are wide. Then there are the flat bones. I told you that most of your hemopoiesis is occurring in your flat bones. If you were to run your fingers along a flat bone, there would be a surface, right, a flat surface. So these would be your ribs, uh, your sternum, the frontal bone, some of the skull bones are considered flat bones even though they have a curvature in them. And the scapula would also be considered a flat bone. And then the rest of them are in this garbage pail called irregular. So this is going to be your irregularly shaped bones like your vertebra, also some hematopoiesis, um, ethmoid, sphenoid, right? Those are definitely oddly shaped bones with lots of processes on them. So those are some of your... Um, Irregulars. So just a couple more examples of them. So if we're talking about long bones, right, something like the femur, irregular bones, the vertebra, the flat bones, the frontal bone, but don't forget that would also include the sternum, the ribs, and then the, the tarsals would be your short bones along with your carpals and your patella. Okay, pretty obvious. Pretty obvious. So we've already been through the long bone anatomy story. I've already pointed out these structures to you in lab. Let me give you the couple extra features that are additional to what we learned. Number one, what bone is this? Whenever I get the chance, I'm going to quiz you, naming the bone and naming the bone markings. So what bone is this? This is the humerus, right? It's got a rounded head to it but it's nowhere near as, you know, as big and bulky as the femur. It still has all the long bone anatomy characteristics, though, that the femur does. Recall that uh, there's a hollow cavity. That could be called the marrow cav cavity or the medullary cavity. Can you tell us the difference between that looking at it, whether that's a right or a left, or do they both generally look the same? You would be able to tell, but it's beyond the scope of this course. And the way you'd be able to tell is by looking here at the distal end and knowing whether or not the ulna came in at the front or the back of it. So I'm not going to get into that right now. You're not going to be responsible for left and right. Um, but yeah, you would be able to tell. But for this, for all, everything in Biology 105, I will not be asking you to differentiate between left and right. Okay. You will have to be able to differentiate between medial and lateral when it comes to the malleolus or to the condyles of the femur. So I guess in that case, you do have to be thinking about left or right. But I'm not going to say, is this a left femur or a right femur, per se. Um, on the outside of a long bone, if it was a freshly uh, uh, secured bone, there would be a layer of tissue called the periosteum on the outside, sort of a layer, peri, around the entire bone. Um, in the inside, lots and lots of blood vessels, right? Don't forget that around the outside edge of this bone, this is compact bone. If we were to look at that compact bone under the microscope, we would see the characteristic osteons with the central canals and the canaliculi and all the story that we know and will remind you about in a minute. This bone, has this bone reached its adult length? Yeah, and how do I, how do I know that? What am I seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing an epiphyseal line. So again, if you see the line, that means that the growth plate has fused. It is no longer a gap there. This bone has reached its adult height. Again, on the two ends where it's going to articulate, I can see some cartilage. So you see the white cartilage down here? Now you tell me what bones are going to articulate on the distal end of the humerus. The ulna and the radius. Good. And while we're there, uh, let's think about it. What are the bone markings here? Where the ulna attaches or articulates? 
the trochlea, good, and the humerus on a rounded structure called the capitulum, right? So the head of the radius, that rounded end of the radius, articulates into this little rounded end called the capitulum. We see little blood vessels coming out, right? Those blood vessels are uh, nutrient foramina. We need to get nutrients into the bone. This is living tissue. It needs a blood supply. Don't forget, too, that blood, though, is being released from the bones. So we need a way of getting that blood out. So we, have, we definitely have a lot of communication in and out of our bones. Although I still think we, we imagine our bones as being these sticks, right, that are not necessarily connected to other things in quite the same way. What's new here? We know the diaphysis is the shaft. We know the epiphysis are the two knobby ends, both a proximal and a distal epiphysis. What's new is that we have a metaphysis, okay, meta, in the middle. So the metaphysis is defined as this area between the bars here, okay. And the metaphysis is basically the area between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, the shaft. And it is within the metaphysis where you would find the growth plate. So if this were still an actively lengthening bone, there would be a gap, and that gap would be within the metaphysis, and we would call it the growth plate. Say it again for me. The the yep. Yes, it is. It is going to be a tissue. If you just go to the butcher and get a bone, you're going to notice that on the outside. I mean, it's very much attached to the bone, but on the outside, there would definitely be a tissue-like layer that would be in addition to the hard bone below it. That's just going to be the periosteum. What kind of tissue? A little bit of epithelial, a little bit of connective tissue. Yeah. Now, there's also when you mentioned periosteum, there's also the endosteum. Okay, endosteum. Endo meaning within. So within the bone at the border between the compact bone and the spongy bone, right? That border between, so I'm running the pen right along the endosteum, right? So on the inside, there's the endosteum. On the outside, there's the periosteum. It's pretty much at the ends here in a long bone, right? Uh, there'll be a little bit moving down, but the medullary cavity is largely truly hollow without any spongy bone. Let's zoom in a little bit, talk about this periosteum and endosteum in a close-up. So we're looking at this bone in the center, and we're zooming into this box. Right? We're zooming into this box. And in this box, we're going to see another couple of cell types. We're zooming in. We're at the endosteum, are we not? Right? We're in between the the marrow cavity, and the compact bone. And here, what, what does this little bug represent? That represents an osteocyte living in a lacuna, and the extensions would be the canaliculi. OK, so we've seen that bug-looking structure before. That is definitely an osteocyte. But around the outside edge of the bone, there are going to be some osteoblasts. You know, osteoblasts are actively building bone cells. Blast, right? Site. Osteocytes are sort of in a semi-retirement. They're not as metabolically active as they were. But before they cocooned themselves in the hard bony matrix, they were building it, and they were osteoblasts. So osteoblasts will become, once they cocoon themselves, osteocytes. There's also progenitor cells here. Now, progenitor cells are like stem cells. They, they're cells that, um, that actually create the osteoblasts. So the osteoprogenitor cells are sitting around. They're like stem cells. If you damage a bone, then the osteoprogenitor cells can make more osteoblasts and begin to actively heal the bone. Just like you have stem cells in your skin, which when you cut yourself will start making more skin. Same idea here, osteoprogenitor cells making more bone. Those three cell types are related. Osteoprogenitors make osteoblasts. Osteoblasts make bone and then become osteocytes. There's another uh, cell type here, though, that's not related, and that is an osteoclast. 
Now we know from our vocabulary that clast means to break down. These are bone cells that are actively breaking down bone. And what you have is a balancing act between osteoblasts making new bone and osteoclasts that are breaking it down. Now osteoblasts are going to take calcium from your diet and make new bone. Osteoclasts are going to release the calcium as needed. Right, so there's this constant yin-yang, this constant balancing act of your skeletal system, such that you're always making bone and you're always, always breaking it down a little bit. So again, just to, to label the, the layers here, the endosteum, that layer between the compact bone and the marrow cavity, and the periosteum, this outer layer. A lot of collagen in there, a lot of connective tissue like uh, proteins, and um, here on this picture, the periosteum has been pulled off. Okay, so imagine just pulling the periosteum off. We're here on the outside of the bone, and there's clearly a layer that can be pulled off before you get to the layers of bone, okay? Layers after layers. Now, we know what those layers are called. What are those layers called? Each layer within bone is called a lamella, right? So we've seen this idea. And many of those lamellae are arranged in circles or cylinders called osteons. So here are those four bone cells again, if you didn't catch all those details. So the osteoprogenitor cells, these are the stem cells. They are the cells that are hanging around waiting to uh, repair your bone. Here I say that they're derived from mesochyme. That's true. We know that term. I introduced the other term, though. I introduced the term mesoderm. Remember, that's the middle layer of your tissues, and it was from your mesoderm that all of your muscles and connective tissues were derived. So mesenchyme equals mesoderm. And from the osteoprogenitor cells, we will make more osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are the ones that are actually creating, producing new bone. Think B for build, right? So the blasts are building new bone. They're going to build this bone and encapsulate themselves within it, at which time we now, they become differentiated. They become different, and we now call them osteocytes. These are mature cells. They're in what I call semi-retirement. They're not building as actively. Those are the cells that we learned about that are hanging out in the lacunae. And then finally, these three are related, right? They are similar. They're, they're derived one from another. A totally different kind of cell are the osteoclasts. And the osteoclasts are more macrophage-like. And these are huge cells. I'll show you a picture in a moment. They are multinucleated. They don't have a single nucleus. They've, they've got multiple nuclei. They're huge cells. That's our first multinucleated cell that we've seen. And they're phagocytic, which means that they are able to gobble up, chew up, break down. And they do so by releasing hydrochloric acid. Remember I mentioned in lab last week, if you soak an acid in, or soak, soak a bone in acid, that it will begin to eat away at the calcium and make it softer. So the osteoclasts are eating away at the bone, releasing the calcium into the body. They also have lots and lots of lysosomes. Makes sense, because as they are phagocytosing, as they're bringing things in, they need to be able to break it down. So remember, the lysosomes are an organelle that are helping to break down different proteins. So these are big old cells, multinucleated, acid-secreting. And again, our bones are in this constant state of growth and rebuilding and breakdown, rebuilding and breakdown. Really a competition between these cell types. So just to get a grasp of these pictures, I agree this doesn't look like bone that you've seen. Okay, but these cells are cocooned within the lacunae. Those are your osteocytes. Okay, I wouldn't have you recognize this picture. But I do want you to appreciate the osteocytes are definitely cocooned within the lacunae. Along the edge, though, right, where the cells are not yet cocooned, that would be an osteoblast. At the edge, actively building new bone. And then look at how much bigger this cell is. This is an osteoclast. It's a huge cell. 
Now the cartoon up here is showing us an osteoclast. Okay, that's one cell. It has multiple nuclei. It has lots and lots of lysosomes in there that are breaking things down. It has all these extensions which are phagocytic. It's releasing hydrochloric acid. And so it, it makes indentations in the bone, doesn't it? It actually eats away at the bone. You can see how much smaller those little osteocytes are right, compared to that huge osteoclast. These are osteoclasts, okay? Nice view, just a simple view. Um, but you can see they have these long extensions and they're releasing hydrochloric acid. We need a constant supply of calcium, but if you put, let me, let me back up a little bit and make this make more sense to you. Your bone is largely made up of calcium and phosphate. When calcium and phosphate are both in high amounts in one place, they form bone. You never want to have high calcium and high phosphate in your blood because basically you would make little crystals. You would make bone-like pieces, and that happens. We get kidney stones, we get liver stones, we get crunchiness of our aorta because bone-like, you know, atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries is kind of bone filling up and filling up the, the arteries. So we do have examples where, uh, you know, with kidney stones where calcium and phosphate levels are too high. So our body wants to keep those levels low, but it needs a constant availability of it. So as our body needs calcium, those osteoclasts start chewing away and release calcium into the bloodstream. During pregnancy, if a mother, if a woman is not getting adequate calcium in her diet, her bones are getting robbed of calcium because that baby, that new baby's skeleton is going to get formed and the mother's going to lose calcium from her bones and her bones will become weaker if she does not provide adequate calcium in her diet during that time. So again, we have this constant flux of calcium. Is that what the teeth Say it again for me. Why it can affect the teeth as well. What can affect the teeth? Uh, calcium. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you need to be having lots of calcium during pregnancy, no doubt about it. But outside of pregnancy, right, outside of being a young child and outside of pregnancy, we don't want to overdo our calcium because people overdo their calcium. You should have about 1,100, 1,200 milligrams a day. And if you think, oh, grandma had osteoporosis, so I'm going to take twice as much calcium, and I'm going to have two yogurts a day, and a block of cheese, and a glass of milk, and you're overdoing your calcium, in 10 years you'll be seeing your doctor with kidney stones, right, or gallstones. So be really careful, right? Overdoing calcium can lead to other problems. That's why we have a recommended daily allowance, and overdoing it is not better. Sometimes when, um, like, say you have a paraplegic. Mm -hmm. Yes. If in a paraplegic or, or in a person with any kind of spinal cord damage, if you don't use the bones, you lose them. And so the bones will naturally regress and become less, uh, as will the muscles. So there's no nervous system attached to muscles. The muscles will waste away, and the bones also will waste away. So uh, that's, just, that's just the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, to where they had to shave the bone away um, after he, you know, obviously. Right. The muscles will waste away, but the bones will sometimes continue to. It's, um, I don't know specifically what the mechanism is, but I know it happens where the bones can continue to enlarge. Yeah. Is that, I mean, they had to, like, shave Yep, cut them out. Yeah, absolutely. And is it coming back again? Yeah. Yeah, just continues just, to. I don't know that it's at the osteoblast, osteoclast level. There's some other hormonal things going on. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about long bones. Uh, short bones are just kind of the same thing, nothing really fancy there. Let's talk about flat bones a little bit. They're a little bit different in their architecture. And um, flat bones, if we think about like the frontal bone and the parietal bones, those are considered flat bones. And what they're actually composed of is two layers of compact bone 
And in between, sandwiched in between, is a layer of spongy bone. That spongy bone middle is called the diploid. Okay? So dip, like two layers, right? There's two layers of compact bone. Inside is this diploid or this layer of spongy bone in between. And what's different about it is that you have uh, periosteum on both outer layers, if you will, of the bone, but there is no endosteum. So let's take a look at this little chunk of skull. Right? What bone is this? Let's do our bone markings and our bone rundown. So this would be part of the parietal bone, right? And while we're here, um, oh, it's kind of small to see, but what's this little structure right here? Mastoid process, okay. And there's a little straight structure back there. That is the styloid process, good. And there's an opening here called the external auditory or external acoustic meatus. So what you see is that when we take out a chunk of skull, there is a layer of compact bone, a layer of compact bone with a layer of diploid in between, a layer of spongy bone in between. There is a layer of periosteum on the outside. There's a layer of periosteum on the inside, but there is no endosteum. Okay, so there's no endosteum in this bone. That's just by definition, just the way that it is. The next couple of slides you know well. You know this story. You may not have seen this particular picture, though. This is an electron micrograph, and you're looking at a slice of bone. So let's look at this one, because it's so different from what we've seen so far. You can now clearly see the central canal. You can clearly see the sort of circular arrangement of the entire osteon structure. You can see the indentations. Those little caves would be the lacunae. We can't see the cells, they're, they're dead, but within those lacunae there would be osteocytes, and these osteocytes and lacunae are arranged in sort of circular arrangements that we call lamellae, right? And what we can't see so well, but you can see them, I guess, if you look really closely, there are some stress marks or little canals, maybe easier to see in the lower picture, and those are the what? Canaliculi. So we've been through that. You've been quizzed on it. I think you know this story well. Uh, there's one thing we cannot see on this picture, but we will see in the three-dimensional model, and those are the Volkman or the perforating canals. And again, you've seen those on that big birthday cake model upstairs in the lab. So let's look at a Volkman's canal here. This would be a Volkman's canal, right, because it is connecting one central canal of an osteon to another central canal of an osteon. And so those perforating or Volkman canals connect the two. Choose a name you like. They're both exactly the same thing. But when you read about it, you need to know that they're the same thing. But if you were asked uh, what that is, uh, you can put down perforating or Volkman's. Also, when you look at this three-dimensional model of the, of the um, like the birthday cake model, this layer, as we go from compact bone into spongy bone, That'd be the endosteum at that level, at that layer. And then what we're peeling off here would be the periosteum. Okay, lots of blood vessels on the outside as well. How does bone get formed? So we know the structure of the bone. We know what bone looks like under the microscope. Um, the process of making bone is referred to as ossification, becoming ossified. So bone is formed, and it's formed actually through a different, two different types of ossification. There's intramembranous. Well, what does that mean? Intra means within. So somehow within a membrane, we're going to make bone, right? It tells us there's something within a membrane. And this is how your flat bones are made. So your flat bones are made by this process, right, of intramembranous ossification. However, the majority of your bones your long bones, short bones, and many of your regular bones are made by another process, endochondrial ossification. And that tells us what? Break it down. That within cartilage, right? So somehow we started off with a cartilage model as a template, and then from that cartilage, bone was formed. Okay, and that's what most of your 
bones are made by. So we know bones are formed through this thing called ossification, and we're not surprised that bones grow. Bones grow in two different ways. They grow bigger in diameter, right? No surprise. Your bones are bigger in diameter than they were when you were two years old, and they are longer. So bones grow bigger in diameter. Bones grow longer in length. When bones grow larger in diameter, that type of growth is called appositional growth. So appositional growth is an increase in diameter. There are new lamellae, new layers that are laid down. So when you think about bone looking like a tree trunk and having annual rings, those lamellae, it's not that far off, right? Because as you're developing, your bones are laying more layers down. And so our bones get larger in diameter, partially through this appositional growth. Lengthening of bone is, again, this idea of endochondrial within cartilage. So your bone lengthening is called endochondrial, and it happens through endochondrial ossification. That name is there twice. I know it's a little confusing. So your uh, bones are getting bigger in diameter through appositional growth. Your uh, bones are lengthening through endochondrial uh, growth, which includes endochondrial ossification. Let's take a look at appositional growth. So here is a cut through a femur of a little infant, a child, and then you and me. What do we notice as we progress from left to right? What do you notice? Overall diameter, right, getting larger. That, an increase in appositional growth, no doubt. Um, also an increase in the size of the marrow cavity. And also an increase in the thickness of the bone, isn't there? Okay, so we have a thickness, a thickening of the bone, a greater diameter. And all of this change is happening because throughout your childhood, you had a lot of osteoblasts building bone. They were primarily the cell type that was taking off, and they were building new bone. Now, they were given directions through hormones and other things about where to build the bone. But there was always also some... some Competition, if you will, by the osteoclasts. Think about your bones. They all have their own shape. Every bone has its own shape. Some bones have foramen, right, openings. Some bones have little trochanters, little bumps, little grooves. And where did all that come from? All those grooves were formed by the breakdown of bone. So osteoclasts knew where to carve out the bone like a, ch like a chisel in the hands of an artist of a sculptor, right? And so you've got this competition between osteoblasts and osteoclasts building bone to their proper length and their proper size and shape. Pretty cool stuff. So again, um, appositional growth is going to occur largely in the periosteum, okay? Uh, you're going to get new layers, right? New growth rings, if you will, making your bones wider. And then you're also going to have um, a lengthening of your bones through this endochondrial growth. So endochondrial ossification means that your bones are starting off as a hyaline model. Uh, we're not going to get into where did the hyaline come from, right? That's, that's another story that backs up earlier in development. But we're going to start our bone story knowing that there was a hyaline cartilage model there. If you have ever seen in a picture, or maybe you went to Bodies Reveal three or four years ago when they were in Grand Rapids, uh, off from the reproductive room, there was this little area that said, warning, warning, sensitive area. And they had a series of fetuses and embryos of developmental stages um, in, in, in really well-presented uh, presentation, but there was backlighting. And in the, about the third month or so, you could look almost right through the little fetuses. I mean, you could see right through them because their skeleton at that point was still hyaline. It's still that glassy or transparent cartilage, and you can see right through it. So then you can appreciate that name, hyaline cartilage. Again, your long bones, your vertebra, uh, were all made by this form of endochondral oss ossification. So this blue chunk represents a chunk of cartilage. Okay, that's where we're going to start our bone story. 
and this cartilage is sitting there. It's, it's your pre-skeleton, if you will. Notice there are no blood vessels, right? This thing is avascular. The cells that would be in here would be chondrocytes, and this cartilage would have been made by chondroblasts. It's sitting there around the outside. There would be a layer of tissue called the perichondrium. It's equivalent, right? Periosteum around bone, perichondrium around cartilage. So it's just a chunk of cartilage. Now what happens is that through different hormonal signals and different developmental signals, blood vessels will begin to permeate into the diaphysis of this chunk. Now with that blood flow comes oxygen and some other hormonal signals. Well, chondrocytes, as you know, are not used to oxygen. They are very comfortable being avascular cells, right? And when that oxygen comes in, it's too much for them to handle. That's the way I think about it. And they differentiate. They become different. And those, those chondrocytes now start looking like and behaving like bone cells. Okay? They are differentiated into osteocytes. And so now we've got blood flow in the shaft, in the diaphysis of the bone. This is no longer cartilage. It's now turned kind of brown. This represents just bone. So that's called the primary ossification center. This attack always happens at the shaft first. There's a second area, though, at each of the epiphyses. We also see that blood vessels are also penetrating into the two epiphyses. And likewise, there's an ossification that happens on the two ends. But in between, in that metaphysis area where the growth plate is, it will maintain a cartilage layer. Right? So that area of blue is still cartilage. Those cells are still chondroblasts and chondrocytes. And they're lengthening, creating increased lengthening of the bone. So the bone is going to lengthen from its two ends, from these two growth plates. Okay? Eventually, right, eventually we end up with, this would be like my 16-year-old son, right? So his bone is, it's all bone in the center. Oops. It's all bone in the center. On the two ends, it's all bone, right? Lots of blood flow, normal bone, spongy bone, everything else. But there'd still be this gap, right? This gap called the growth plate. Now, by the time he's, you know, a couple more years from now, this growth plate's going to start fusing, getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it will form the growth, the, the, sorry, the epiphyseal line. Once we have that line, the growth plate's gone. No more lengthening of the bone. And now, because that cartilage is gone, ossification becomes contiguous. So there's now complete bone all the way through from epiphysis through the diaphysis to the next epiphysis. And all we're left with is sort of that scar, if you will, that epiphyseal line. So that's how most of your bones were formed. Cartilage through this primary, then secondary invasion of blood, the maintenance of the growth plate, and then finally fusion of that growth plate. Now, once we reach adult height, are we done? Are our bones done? And the answer is no. Look at a, an 85-year-old person, right? And you look at their picture when they were 65, and look at them again when they're 85. Is their skeleton continuing to change? Clearly, our skeleton never stops changing. Now, during our adult years, it kind, kind of stays the same. But clearly, during early development, it's changing a lot. And as we get older, clearly, there'll be changes in our skeleton, a little bit more frail, a little bit weaker, um, and changes even in the shape of our skeleton. Take a look at this foot x-ray. This is so cool. Look at this nine-month-old little baby's foot. I mean, is it any wonder our kids can walk? at nine months, right? Kids start walking around nine and 10 months a lot, right? That's about the time I'm trying to weigh them down, saying don't walk, don't walk, don't walk, sit there, right? Wait till you know the word no. But kids start walking around nine or 10 months. Look at their little, their little old metatarsals are nowhere near touching their tarsals, nowhere near touching their little phalanges. No wonder you can squeeze shoes into, you know, you know, squeeze a shoe on a little kid, they don't complain. They don't have bones touching bones. And even up through second and, you know, second and third year, even kindergarten, there's still big gaps between the bones, right? The bones have not yet fused. Now, they're continuing to elongate. Now, if you look, look right here. Do you see from the back of the room? 
Do you see that gap? There's a gap. There's a pretty obvious gap there. Those are the growth plates. Right? You can actually see the ossification. You can see the, bony, uh, the boniness of one side and then the other side. That would be the growth plate. So that little bone has not yet reached its adult height. It's still growing longer. It's eventually going to run into the other bones. And, and eventually here, when we get up to about you know, an adult bone, OK, that looks like your x-ray. So now you see all the little metatarsals have connected to all the phalanges. And now when you look at these, what, what does this little gap right here represent? This little area now represents the joint. You really don't see, you, there are no longer any growth plates anywhere on here. If you look carefully with me, though, you might see some epiphyseal lines. So like maybe right here. There's a line. Again, you kind of got to get your eye trained to see it, but it looks like there's some little line-like shadows. So those are adult length bones. They no longer have any growth plate. There's no longer anything but an epiphyseal line as evidence. All of the tarsals have fused together. Those seven bones that make up the ankle have fused. So I've already told you this story. Take a look at this little, little femur over here. So this is a, let me change colors to white. You can see, right? What is that bone marking right there? That's the greater trochanter, right? And you can see there's a gap there. If you look back at it, let me clean it off. You can actually see there's a gap there. And there's also a pretty significant gap here in the neck of that young femur. Now, as an adult, we don't see it. We see more of a line, right? So we have lines now, epiphyseal lines. But you can actually see it in the, in the gross bone looking at it, the space. So this endochondrial ossification continues uh, progressively. Some of our bones are finished ossifying at about age 10. So some of our bones have reached their adult size and are done with all their fusion and everything by age 10. Others, not until age 25, especially in men. So there's a constant changing of our skeleton. If, you, if a forensic scientist finds a skeleton or finds a body and it's a younger person, they can, they can estimate you know, the age of that skeleton, the age of that person at death, based upon all sorts of bones, which ones have fused, which ones have not fused, look at the wearing of their teeth. There are a lot of different things they can look at. But they can definitely look at the combination of growth plates on the x-rays and determine approximately how old is this individual. Now, as bone is made from cartilage, um, Martini will have a, a, a two-page spread on this, and it will talk about the five stages. Don't worry about the stages. But it, there's definitely you know, some, some progression as we go from cartilage into bone. But let's not worry about any of those details. So I'm trying to convince you that your bones are constantly changing. When bones are being formed, the term is deposition. Okay, so you're deposit making a deposit in the bank. So your osteoblasts, right, your osteoblasts are going to be making a deposit, making new bone, deposition. And then the osteoclasts are going to be breaking down bone, and we don't call it a withdrawal, but we call it a resorption, right? So the bone is being resorbed. And you hear about, you know, as people get older, they're worried about their bone resorption because the osteoclasts sort of start getting the upper hand and bone is not being made as fast as it's being broken down. So during, during childhood, clearly we have more deposition than reabsorption. During adulthood, kind of a steady state, right? Our bones aren't changing dramatically, although at the microscopic level, Yes, new bone is being made and bone is being broken down as we're releasing and storing calcium. And then as we get older, we'll see that um, the osteoclasts can, in some people, and especially in some disease states, begin to get the upper hand, right? Really chewing away at the bone, leading to things like osteoporosis. About 20% of your skeleton is being replaced every year. That's another way of thinking about it. So every five years, you really have a whole new set of bones on average, right? So about 20% every year, you are eating away and creating new bone all the time. So the changes are slow. What else, though, besides just aging, can influence the 
bone growth. And some of this is hormones. So what, what makes us grow so quickly as children? Well, your pituitary gland is making a hormone called growth hormone. And this growth hormone is, is affecting your overall metabolism and keeping you growing at a rather rapid pace throughout your early years. That growth hormone actually stimulates right, the epiphyseal plate, stimulates that cartilage, starts to really cause your bones to elongate. And um, about puberty, right, or as we get into a young adulthood, that growth hormone level begins to, to fall off. So we don't have lengthening of our bones after, uh, much after puberty. If you watch any of the TLC kind of shows about the seven foot giant in China, right? So those individuals almost always have a tumor of the pituitary gland that is overproducing growth hormone and their body just continues to grow and grow and grow. So they're seven foot and they're still growing taller, right? And, and the problem is, is that their cardiovascular system can no longer keep pumping blood up seven feet, right, to the seventh foot. Um, their joints start breaking down. They start having lots and lots of issues with their overall body. So growth hormone certainly influences our overall bone growth, but also sex hormones. Tell me what happens around seventh grade. Right? Puberty, right? Now, girls usually reach puberty earlier than guys. About 18 months is the average gap. And the deal is this, though. Estrogen, right, female hormones that are now being produced in large number, large amounts when female puberty comes along, actually stimulates the ossification of the growth plate. That means it's actually causing the bones to fuse and to reach their adult height. Most women, think back ladies, you were at your adult height within about 18 months of menses. So as menstruation began and as you reached that point in your life, if you look back, probably within about 18 months of your first menstrual period, you reached your adult height. Now there's a few exceptions now and then, but about 18 months, right? So if you have any daughters, you know, when that time comes, you know, they're not going to grow a whole lot more past menses. Whereas testosterone, right? So, so, you know, girls reach puberty and they have a little spurt, but not much, and then they kind of stop. And then the guys, about 18 months later, about the time the ladies are done with their growth, testosterone's kicking in, and testosterone in the guys actually causes a faster cartilage growth and causes that lengthening, that, that tallness factor that occurs with most guys. Uh, with puberty. And so that's what's going on at a hormonal level related to the bones. But guys will certainly keep growing. I mean, there's, there are a lot of incidents of guys who don't reach their adult height to their 21, right? So 18, 19, 20, you'll still see guys coming back in college first and second year who have gotten taller. Not at all uncommon. So is the theory of the caffeine stunts bone growth just a theory? Is um, does caffeine stunt bone growth? I don't know that that one has a whole lot of validity. I mean, if I, if I just, I've heard those reports, but if you look at our average height in this country, right, we're definitely taller than we were 100 years ago, and we weren't sucking down sodas 100 years ago. So I don't think that caffeine's had a whole lot of a negative effect. Um, maybe other things, right, but not, not that. What else is affecting this? Vitamins for sure. Okay, certainly in our society, we're better, um, I was going to say vitaminized, that's not the right word, right? We have better nutrition. So vitamin A. Vitamin A, we do, definitely know, activates osteoblasts. So if you want to build new bone and keep new bone going, you definitely want to have vitamin A. Well, where do we find vitamin A? Your milk is fortified with both vitamin A and vitamin D, right? So the vitamin A is also, we're getting it in our dairy products as well. Definitely keeping our, quote, bones strong, keeping them building. Vitamin C, citrus fruits, um, is necessary for collagen. Remember, collagen is the steel protein within our bones. We need to have strong collagen to have strong bones. So vitamin C is necessary for strong bones. Years ago, when people would go on sea trips and they wouldn't have citrus fruits, they would get scurvy. And scurvy is a condition of not enough vitamin C, and their bones became what? They lose their collagen, and their bones became more... What do you think? 
if you lost all the collagen, you lay, you'd lose all the strength of your bone, wouldn't they? And they would start getting kind of soft bones. They would start getting a little bit, a little bit uh, weak, weak bones. Now, vitamin D also in our milk um, is helping with uh, absorption of calcium and phosphorus. So in order for your bones to take up and for your uh, digestive system to absorb calcium into your body, you want to have plenty of vitamin D. And then finally, exercise has a tremendous effect on our bones. Mechanical stress is necessary. The best thing you can do for grandma or anyone else and yourself is just to keep moving. And it doesn't have to be a lot of weight, but mechanical stress on the bones is necessary to keep them remodeling. And by remodeling, I mean constantly being rebuilt. So if you stop using bones, they kind of start wasting away. And this is what happens when you put a cast on, right, for six or eight weeks, and you come back and you realize the bones have atrophied. Not only did the muscle atrophy, but so did the bone to some extent. And so you want to keep moving, using uh, mechanical stress on your bones. That will keep your bones stronger. So weight-bearing activities are very, very important. If you don't have that mechanical stress, if you don't have those weight-bearing activities, you will begin to demineralize your bones. That means there'll be less calcium, less phosphate, and there'll be less collagen production. Your osteoblasts aren't as happy. So again, you've got less steel and less mineral content, and overall, you can have a breakdown in your bones, and that can lead to things like osteoporosis. They're talking about the entire bone. Uh, they're looking at soft and compact bone. And they're looking at the density, how dense the bone tissue is. It truly is a bone density issue. And with osteoporosis, I'll show you a picture in a moment, but the pores, the, the spaces, especially in the, com sorry, in the spongy bone, start to get larger. And so there's less density to the bone, leading to easier fracture. So let me go into just a little bit of a physiology story here with you. This will be the kind of, I mean, this semester so far, what you're noticing is we're learning a lot of structures. We're naming a lot of things. It's a lot of, quote, memorization, right? I don't like that word, but it, it really is what it's involved, right? We're, we're, we're memorizing a lot of structures, and we haven't really figured out how they all go together necessarily very well yet. In 106, we'll take the pieces and parts we're learning, and we'll learn how to assemble them into more of a, of a meaningful story. So let me give you a little... I guess, uh, flavor of that. So we're going to be looking at bones, and we're looking at calcium. We know that calcium is important. And there's a certain amount of calcium in your blood. And we need to keep our, cal our blood calcium levels rather constant. If our, if our calcium levels begin to drop below where they should be, we have a gland in our neck, behind our thyroid gland, called the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland very easily makes a hormone called parathyroid hormone. When our calcium levels are low, the parathyroid gland starts to release parathyroid hormone. And this hormone is going to do everything it can to tell tissues in the body to raise the calcium levels back up. Okay? Now, how would you do that? If you were the, 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 the chief engineer of your body, and you had this alarm going off saying, whoa, we don't have enough calcium. And this hormone, parathyroid hormone, was being sent out throughout your body. What are mechanisms that you would enact to increase your calcium levels? How about turn on your osteoclasts? Because what do they do? They're chewing away at the bone. As they chew away, they're releasing calcium. So the calcium levels would start to rise back up, right? We're going to restore the calcium levels. You also could go to your kidneys and say, hey, kidneys, the next time you urinate, don't let as much calcium leave. Resorb or maintain or recapture, however you want to think about it, but keep as much calcium in the body as possible. Don't let it become part of the urine. That hormone could also go to the skin to the integumentary system and say, you know what, skin, we need more vitamin D. We didn't talk about it too much, but right, UV radiation to your skin makes vitamin D. I told you vitamin D is necessary for calcium to be absorbed. So if we get more vitamin D, we can also absorb more calcium into our body from our diet. And thirdly, 
I'd go to my gut and say, you know what, gut? The next time you see calcium coming through, hang on to it, right? Definitely absorb it into the body. Do you agree that all four of those mechanisms would slowly raise the calcium level back up? So now our calcium levels are normal, right? They're back to normal. Now, there's another hormone that does the opposite of this. So the opposing hormone is calcitonin. That's an A, sorry. Calcitonin is the other hormone that does exactly the opposite. Okay, let me show you a picture here, and let's figure this out. So, number one, uh, the blood levels, which way do I have this? Here I have, um, we've got a, a situation here where the, the calcium, again, is too low. And so what are we going to do? What hormones can be released? PTH will be released, and what will it do? Cause osteoclasts to release calcium into the blood. Tell the kidneys to allow more recycling of the calcium. Tell the gut to absorb more calcium, right? And do all of these things to raise the blood calcium back up. But what if instead the blood calcium levels are too high? I told you before that if blood calcium is too high, it's not a good thing either that you'll start creating kidney stones and having too much calcium is not a good thing either. So when calcium is too high, that calcitonin is released. Now calcit calcitonin is made by your thyroid gland, right? So the parathyroid gland is making the parathyroid hormone. The calcitonin is being made by the neighboring gland. This is a butterfly-shaped gland in your throat, the thyroid gland. So when your calcium is too high, right, calcitonin is released, and guess what it does? Just turn it all the way around, right? So if you had high calcium, what would you tell your bones? Build, right? Build. There's calcium available bones. Go ahead and start making more bone so you would activate your osteoblasts, right? Because you want to get that calcium out of the bloodstream and into building the bone. You would tell your gut what? I don't need it right now, let it go. You would tell your kidneys, let it flow, right? And you would tell your skin, I don't need more vitamin D right now. So again, these hormones go and uh, interact with multiple systems. Just appreciate this, this little yin-yang story between parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. And this is very much a flavor of where we'll be heading next semester when we talk about more of the physiology of this. Hypercalcemia can definitely cause some heart issues. Um, anytime there's increased calcium, you can affect your nervous system, your muscular system, you can affect your blood clotting. There are lots of things that can go wrong. Absolutely. Okay, so we've been building bone. Let's now repair it. So what happens when you break a bone? It's a big bloody mess. Right? There's a lot of blood inside your bones. So the very first thing that's going to happen is as you break a bone, there's going to be blood escaping from ruptured blood vessels, and this is going to form a blood clot or a hematoma, right? A, a formation of a blood clot, a hematoma. And osteoclasts, not only can osteoclasts break down bone normally, but when you, re, when you damage a bone, the osteoclasts are going to come in like garbage men and clean up the area. So they're going to come in and, and, and clean up uh, all the dead fragments and all the dead cells, and the osteoclast will start cleaning up the area. Well, now the osteoblasts have a brand new place to build. So you form the blood clot, the osteoclasts were activated and cleaned up the area. The osteoblasts now come in and start rebuilding the bone. Um, and they start knitting the pieces of bone together. Have you ever been to a third world country or known somebody who broke a bone but never got it reset properly? Bones will go back together. I mean, orthopedic surgeons don't do anything magical as far as bones. Bones will find each other again, and they will attach, and they will create a new bone, and they will heal. 
what osteo, what, what the orthopedic surgeons are doing is making sure it's healing in the direct, in the correct orientation, right? So they're, they're trained to get the, the, the bolts and the screws and everything else, the plates, so that when the bones do their natural healing job, that they restore function as much as possible. So basically, um, bones will come back together. So let's take a look at this. Now, that's assuming they're close enough to touch. If the bone is fragmented, if it's just fractured in multiple pieces, it may not come back together by itself. But if you just crack a bone, it will come back. It will be just fine, granted as long as you get the right angles during the fixation period. So here is the bone. We broke it. Big bloody mess, right? Big hematoma is formed. And just like new bone, or just like bone is formed from cartilage, so too new bone new bone is also formed first largely through an avascular cartilage. So we form a callus, sort of a little bulging area. It's not yet fully bone yet. Eventually that will become ossified and then eventually you'll have contiguous bone formed again, right? And there'd be really no evidence other than on an x-ray you might see a little collar, a little framing around where the fracture was, but for the most part, uh, that bone will go back together and be as strong as it ever was, okay? It really does go back together marvelously well. So again, spongy bone is also part of this. So we go first spongy bone, kind of a cartilage, then a spongy bone, then to compact bone around the edge. We mentioned how um, bones continue to change throughout life. And there are also three rather common uh, deformities seen in the vertebra. Let me just describe these to you, and then we're pretty much, we're getting awfully close to being done with chapter seven. We'll take a quick break. Kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. Now, scoliosis is a term you may have heard of. Maybe some of you in the room suffer or have had been diagnosed with a little bit of scoliosis. Scoliosis is an abnormal lateral curvature of the vertebra. More common in girls. Uh, most of you were probably screened for this in middle school, ele later elementary, maybe didn't even know what they were doing. But typically, you know, the gym teacher comes in with the school nurse and they line you up against the wall and they say, okay, lift up your shirt, right? You're facing the wall, lift up your shirt, and they're just going down. And they're looking to see if your vertebra, if there's a, if there's a significant curvature. And if they see something, they're just kind of screening you. They're going to hand you a little note that says, you know what, Susie, we think your mom and dad should have you checked out for sco possible scoliosis. Um, so that's a lateral curvature. It can be rather significant. It can be rather insignificant. I have a daughter who's 19 now who has, eh, I guess, a moderate case of scoliosis. Uh, nothing that really bothered her too much. Kind of a painful posturing sometimes. She'd wake up a little bit achy. So we went and saw someone, and they gave her this hard cast to sleep in. Now, this thing was in, just intolerable. So it went up on one side really high and down the hip on the other side. And it was basically was this big blue hard plastic cocoon with a little bit of padding on it. And she really, she was supposed to sleep in it. It wasn't supposed to make her scoliosis better, but not let it get any worse. And she didn't tolerate it. So it was just a really expensive thing under the bed. Um, but where it became a problem for her is she's an equestrian. She's a high-level equestrian. And uh, she's down in Kentucky right now doing another horse show. And when she's doing dressage, she does a venting. So when she's doing the dressage portion, it's all about the horse and being balanced and not showing any movement to the judges. And every once in a while, the judges will note that she's just a little bit off kilter, especially the higher competitions. And the horse notices it too. The horse notices that she's a little bit off left or right. And so she kind of has to adjust her body. The horse senses she's even but she's a little bit off, okay? And every once in a while, a judge will mark her down for being uneven during competition. Other than that, it really hasn't affected her. Um, she'll wake up sometimes a little bit, pain, a little bit in, in pain. Lordosis is commonly called swayback. Now, lordosis is a lumbar problem. It's a lower back curvature, an exaggerated curvature of the lower back, more often seen during pregnancy and with chronic obesity. And so with that extra weight on the stomach, the lower lumbar vertebra are being pinched and in curvature a little bit more, okay? And that oftentimes can lead to shooting pains, 
going down the back of the leg. Going off from that lumbar region, there's some nerves that go down to the back of the leg, the sciatic nerve for sure. And that can lead to some shooting pains. Uh, women, right, if you've been pregnant, uh, seventh, eighth, ninth month, maybe some issues with sciatic pain going down the back of the leg. Baby's born, resolved. That lordosis is, is usually referred, is, is taken care of. The, the top one is kyphosis. This is an exaggerated thoracic curvature. This is your hunchback look. Uh, the, the people who are looking at their, you know, looking down and bent over as they walk. So this can become rather uh, significant uh, later in life as well. So let's take a look at them by pictures. Uh, in order that I describe them, on the right, scoliosis. So you can see the lateral curvature, right, the unevenness uh, that can lead to some muscle discomfort and some, some tightening of the muscles. They're just looking from. They're just looking for. Are there changes off from the side? So over. It's just that that. I mean, I think they're looking more than five percent off. Then there might be a little bit concerned if it's over five percent. And then here you can see the curvature here in the lumbar region. Okay, so that's lordosis again, pregnancy or obesity, and leaving right through this area are nerves, the sciatic nerve that heads down. Oops, didn't mean to do that. The heads down to um, the leg. And then finally, uh, there's kyphosis, which is this curvature hunchback of the thoracic vertebra. And this can get really extreme, right, where, the, where they're, they're bent all the way over. OK, those are the three skeletal deformities. That's going to bring us to the end of this presentation. That 8 should be a 7. Okay, I'm not going to be lecturing directly on seven. Seven is in the Martini book, just to name that bone chapter. It's got all the bones and all the bone markings beautifully displayed for you, and I won't be lecturing through that. But you still need to make sure you know terms like this. If I say process, oops, if I say process, what comes to mind? Something that sticks out. If I say a condyle, a rounded, articulating knob. If I say a tuberosity, a roughened process, right? Kind of a bump in a roughened area. We have two tuberosities in our list. We've got the um, ischial tuberosity and the tibial tuberosity. If I say trochanter, you're looking only on the femur. If I say turbicle, you're looking only on the humerus. A meatus, a tube-like passageway. External auditory meatus, and we've seen quite a few foramina, right? An opening in a bone. A fossa, a flattened surface, kind of an indented surface. I don't think we have a fossa on our list right now. So definitely be familiar with those terms, and if you are, then it'll make a, it'll make a whole lot more sense when you're doing your bone markings, if you're familiar with those. Those who have done the quiz that's in the hallway, I quizzed you on those, didn't I? On that quiz. The rest of you are getting it tonight in lab. But I want you to know those different terms. I won't quiz you directly on the lab exam on those. But I'm telling you, if you just know, you know what a process or a, or a tuberosity or a trochanter is, you'll have a lot easier time with the bone markings. So let's take about a 10-minute break here. Uh, maybe not that long, about eight minutes. And uh, grab some water, refresh your mind a little bit, and we'll go on to the next chapter. So exam number two is available to review. I got the last couple copies from the testing center from a couple hybrid students, uh, a few right before lecture, and got those posted grades posted. Uh, so they'll be available tomorrow. Uh, Hillary is in, I want to say in the morning, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday morning, and Monday, Wednesday afternoons. Uh, so the exam, she'll have them starting tomorrow to review. And uh, she'll have the key and everything else to review. Um, Second exam, not as strong as the first. Um, I, I just, historically, the whole transcription translation story just kind of gets over people's heads sometimes, and it just goes a little bit too fast, uh, so it doesn't make sense to them. Uh, but overall, OK. What was the median? Uh, mm, probably closer to a 75. Yeah. Yeah, so it was about 85 in the first exam. So it was really, really high in the first exam. Second exam, eh, not so great. Uh, remember, the grades posted are out of 80 points. Um, and then for exam three on Monday, again, we're, we're, we got a half hour to go still. And 
there's not a whole lot of new information in this chapter, in this joints chapter, and that will leave muscles for us to talk about on Wednesday. Um, there will be, there's a quiz on mastering, and that quiz is due, when did I make it due? Exam is Monday. I think I made it due Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. What I'm trying to do is give you at least a day, right? So once it's due, I mean, I, I don't want you to have it due five minutes before the exam. I want you to get the quiz done, and then you can be studying after the quiz is done. So I think it's, I think it's set for 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, and that will give you a good 20, you know, 26 hours to review uh, after that. There will also be some mastering assignments that you'll want to get at least 80% on. I haven't put the copy there yet, but I will. So if you want to do them a second time, you can do them as well. Now, if you do them only once or you do them twice, I'm going to capture the higher of the two grades. So don't worry about the point total right now that's showing on mastering. That's just a, that's just a number. It has nothing to do with your grade. So just make sure you're getting an 80% or better on each of the assignments. If you miss one or two of them, that's okay. Just make sure you, you know, do the majority of the rest of them. And uh, it'll all work itself out. This, this week is big because we've got the lab exam on Wednesday. Again, that lab exam is going to be starting at 2 and going until lecture time, about an hour and 45 minutes. So from 2 to 4 is what I'm saying. If you'll be done just in time to come to lecture. Or in the evening, 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, and when we're done with the lab, we're done with the lab. So it'll be an early night for those who have the evening and uh, a late start for those who have the afternoon lab. Any questions about the lab exam or anything with the lecture exam so far? The quiz that you were just talking about being due on Sunday, that's which one, the quiz before this lecture exam? Is that what you're Yes. Saying? Okay. Yes. That's, so there's, a, there's two quiz assignments. There are. There's a quiz for the lab exam that's due before you take the lab exam on Wednesday, either in the afternoon or the evening. And then there is the lecture quiz, uh, lecture exam three quiz, right? And that one's due Sunday afternoon. You can go ahead and do it. I mean, you'll have all the information by Wednesday. You've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to, to get that quiz done. But you'll want to make sure it's done by Sunday at 2. Okay, well, let's continue on in Chapter 9. Again, these numbers are off a little bit. This is your Chapter 8 in your Martini book. And again, large amount of what I'm about to say to you is things you've heard in lab either last Monday or, or last Wednesday or today or you'll hear again tonight. And that is that there are three anatomically distinct types of joints. There are fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. So those who just left, left lab, you heard this, and you'll hear it again tonight. So a fibrous joint is where two bones come together, but there's little to no movement. And examples of that would be the sutures, those where the skull bones come together. So you know about the coronal suture. That's the one you need to know, where the frontal bone meets with the two parietal bones. And that's not meant to have any movement, right? Your skull bones don't wiggle. Then there's also what's called the syndesmosis, syndesmoses. And these are where your bones are held together by ligaments. Now, we never see this in the lab. Because right now in the lab, you see an ulna and a radius sitting side by side, right? You put them side by side on the table. You see them side by side on the skeleton. What you can't appreciate is that in your body, connecting your ulna and your radius is a bunch of ligament material, right? Tendon-like or ligament material connecting bone to bone. It's not meant to be a joint. It's not meant to wiggle. It's not meant to move. So it's considered a fibrous joint. And then finally, when your tooth or your teeth fit into the socket, into your maxilla or into your mandible, that space, that joint is called a gomphosis. It's a special kind of fibrous joint. Tooth. Think of the tooth as like a piece of a bone, right? So the bone is fitting into your, into your jaw, and that's a gomphosis. Again, in a normal tooth, there shouldn't be much wiggling going on. So here are examples of those fibrous joints. Again, the sutures, right, holding the bones together of the skull, or in this case, this little ligament down here. Now, where am I here? What two bones? It tells me the fibula and the tibia, right? What is this? Again, every bone marking I can see, I'm going to grab it. What is that bump called? I heard malleolus. Which one, lateral or medial? Yeah, medial malleolus is formed by a portion of the tibia. And this bump 
would be the lateral malleolus, right, formed by the fibula. Cartilaginous joints, where two bones come together but are linked by a big chunk of cartilage. Two easy to example, two examples would be uh, where the ribs and the sternum come together. They're connected by a big chunk of cartilage. It's called the costal cartilage. And also between your vertebra, there's a big chunk of fibrocartilage, what you would call your intervertebral discs, right? Between your vertebra, there's a, a chunk. Another cartilaginous joint, which I don't have on this list, would be your pubic symphysis, right? Or the symphysis pubis, where the two pubis bones come together. There's a chunk of cartilage right there um, at the symphysis pubis. The rest of your joints are considered synovial joints. That is, there's a fluid-filled area within them. They are freely moving joints. And these joints allow us to move our body in unique ways. So there's at least six specific different synovial joint movements. In lab, I went through three. I'm only going to have us go through the same three here. So the ones I want you to know, again, are ball and socket, pivot, and hinge. Those are the only three that I'm going to hold you to. Now, I do want you to look at the names of these other joints. So even though I don't want you to know that they're planar or condyloid, look at the names. If I said to you, point to your intercarpal joints, where would you point? Intercarpals between your carpals, right? So within those carpal bones, there are some synovial joints, which we would describe as being planar. I don't want you to worry about that. But if I said, where are your intercarpal uh, joints, you would imagine where you're going. If I said to you, where is your metacarpophalangeal joints, right, your MP, your meta metacarpophalangeal joints. Well, OK, metacarpals, the long, hand, long bones of my palm, going to my what? To my phalanges. So you would know those better as your knuckles. Or if I said to you, what, where would your carpal metacarpal joints be? Between your carpals and your metacarpals, you know it more as your wrist. OK, so just think about you know, where would these landmarks be? When we talk about the, the ball and socket joints, I won't say the word shoulder. Instead, I'll say glenohumeral. Right? Why? The glenohumeral joint is the coming together of the head of the humerus into the glenoid cavity of the scapula. So the shoulder is anatomically referred to as a glenohumeral joint, the hip joint as the coxal joint, OK, the coxal joint. We can also put a directional term on these. Would you agree that a ball and socket joint is multi-axial? That is, you know, I can move my shoulder in multiple ways, right? I'm not limited and restrict is I have multi-axial movement, whereas a hinge joint is uniaxial, right? One plane. So your elbow and your knee are a healthy knee, a healthy elbow is only moving in one plane. It doesn't have wiggle left or right. The other movements that you're feeling are from other bones, other joints. But if you were to isolate just the wrist, or sorry, just the elbow or just the knee, you would appreciate that it's a uniaxial movement. So a hinge joint, right? really simple. While I'm here, though, let's do bone markings. So this is the what? Specifically, bone marking that is the head of the radius. And the head of the radius fits into the capitulum, right? the capitulum of the ulna. On the ulna, this area would be the trochlea. And the U of the ulna is the trochlear notch, right? The trochlea goes with the trochlear notch. That makes sense. And the tip of the elbow here would be called the olecranon. The olecranon is the tip of the elbow. Last thing, there is a Oh, a third tuberosity right there, right? That's the radial tuberosity in that area. And what attaches to that radial tuberosity? 
Yeah, the muscles of the biceps brachii. So the muscle comes down and, and inserts onto that radial tuberosity, right, and creates an attachment point. So that's a hinge joint. This is a pivot joint. Now, we lose perspective of the bones. Again, I keep saying this, but we don't see. Here's a cute little ligament, right? There's a ligament that goes from one side of the atlas to another side of the atlas and goes around the dens. Remember, the dens is that tooth-like structure that pops up out of C2. And we lose that perspective looking at a bunch of bones. But this, this entire joint is called the atlantoaxial. And that's on your form, on your page. But the atlantoaxial joint. So what is this? This is a joint between the axis and the atlas, between C1 and C2. And together, your head, right, which is resting on C1, is turning and pivoting around this dens of the axis. So this is the pivot joint. And your head, when you say no, your head is pivoting around this dens. Now, the planar, the saddle, and the condyloid, the three that I told you not to worry about, still, you're not going to worry about them. Just know that there are examples of all of these between your carpal bones and your phalanges. So all those other ones, those gliding condyloid saddle-like structures are all found within the wrist and the hand. Then back to ball and socket. Quite a few bone markings here. So let's start right here. That piece of cartilage and the, the other side, that would be what? Am I hearing the pubic symphysis or the symphysis pubis? You'll see it written both ways. Uh, what is this opening? Obturator foramen. Do you have the sacroiliac joint on your list? I do believe you do. No? Maybe? I get confused sometimes. There's a lot to our body, and we're not learning all of it this semester, are we? So I may be wrong on that one. How about, the, I know we have this one, the very top of the ilium is the Iliac crest. Okay, that one's on there. It must be SI joint or not. Now, what's this bump right here? Greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. This narrow region is the neck, head, which fits into the acetabulum. Good. These openings, if I were looking from the back side, would be the dorsal sacral foramina. Good. That's about all we can see on this particular view. Now, there's a trade-off. Talk to any physical therapist, um, and they understand this. Um, the more mobile your joint is, your most mobile joint is your glenohumeral joint. It has the most motility in it, the most mobility, I should say, in it. So we, we have the most mobility, but with it, we pay a price. It's rather unstable. So, you know, a lot of rotator cuff muscle issues, a lot of issues going on with the shoulder. As we go to the other end, we see that your sutures, which are immovable, are the most stable. It makes sense, right? There's an inverse relationship between the mobility of a joint and the stability of a joint. And the shoulder is by far the most mobile, followed by your hip joint, by your coxal joint, right? This one has to be more stable because we walk on this. Right, it has to hold our body weight. We don't walk around in our arms too much. The elbow is kind of intermediate, right? Uh, uh, quite a bit of movement, but still more restricted than the shoulder or the hip, and so it's intermediate in its stability. So let's talk about some of the different movements that our joint spaces allow our body to do. So there are some sliding or gliding changes, and, and those aren't too fancy, not too excited. Most of the, the fun movements of our body involve some sort of angular change. So this is going to include abduction and adduction. The first, in fact, the ones on this list are the same ones I introduced in lab, or will tonight. So you've got abduction and adduction. We know from our vocab that AB means away from, right? And duct means to lead or draw. 
So to lead your arm away from or draw it away from your body, or to draw your leg away, or to do jazz fingers and draw your fingers away from their anatomic position, that would be abduction. To bring them back toward anatomic position, to bring them back toward the center, would be adduction or adduction. Flexion, by definition, is decreasing the angle. So to flex the biceps brachii muscles, you're decreasing the angle of the arm and the forearm. To bring it back out to 180 degrees would be extension, and to go beyond 180 degrees would be hyperextension. If you bend to the side, that's lateral flexion. And finally, if you draw a circle with your finger, your arm, or your leg, that is circumduction, right? Drawing a circle, circumduction. There are some other body movements, though, that I want us to know about. And it looks like I've got some formatting issues down here. But you can see abduction moving away from the arm, or moving, you know, the arm moving away. Right? Upward motion, abduction, bringing it back down would be adduction. And, and you'll see all sorts of descriptions of this. When you walk into a gym, there's a machine, usually the adductor, abductor machine. Have you all been in this one? Right? You sit in it, and in one sitting, uh, you're asked to pull your legs inward. So you're using what muscles? Your adductors, right? And then another setting, you're pushing outward, you're using your abductor muscles. Now, where that machine is placed in your gym tells me a lot about the management of that gym and the overall atmosphere of that gym. If that machine is over in the corner, where it belongs, then OK, it's a serious gym. If that machine's in the front window <laughs> or facing a big mirror, a big body of mirrors, then I know that's a different kind of gym. right? It's just all about, I, that's the ma one machine I look for. Where is that machine in the gym? And it tells me all about the social climate of that gymnasium. Okay. Now, uh, the other terms, right? Flexion, extension, hyperextension, lateral flexion. Again, I think these are pretty straightforward. You would never want to hyperextend your knee, right? That doesn't feel good, or hyperextend your elbow, but we can do so with our wrist. So to flex the wrist would be to decrease the angle. To bring it back up to 180 degrees would be to extend it, and then to hyperextend it would be to bring the angle above and beyond 180 degrees. You can do that with the neck as well. So to look up at the stars, right, you are hyperextending your neck, and under force that could cause whiplash-like changes. Circumduction, finger, arm, foot, again, drawing a circle, keeping the proximal end steady, and circling on the distal end. There are a few more, though, that I did not mention in lab that I want you to appreciate as well. You'll hear the word rotation or pivot. Uh, they kind of are synonymous. But then there are some special ones that we don't hear about. They're, they're, they're restricted to a localized area of the body. Depression. Well, if you're depressed, you're kind of down. So depression is a lowering of the body in any sort of way where you're lowering the shoulders down. That's probably the easiest way to think about it. But any sort of inferior movement of the body. To raise the shoulders, though, that would be elevation. Right? To elevate the shoulders, elevation. To depress the shoulders would be an example of depression. Not too difficult. Um, dorsiflexion. If you take your ankle and you're, you're using your toes and you're trying to kick up, right? Kicking up, that would be dorsiflexion. Whereas toe point is plantar flexion. These are only dealing with the ankle. So you've got dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Picture's coming. Eversion and inversion, these all have opposites. So eversion is turning the sole of the foot laterally to evert. To invert would be to turn it in more medially. Pronation and supination. You know that in anatomic position, your ulna and your radius are parallel. Right? So if you look at a skeleton in anatomic position, I think one of ours upstairs, he's crossing over, so he's a little bit messed up. But in anatomic position, the, the own and the radius are parallel. If you, in, in an anatomic position, your palms are facing forward. Okay? If I were to rotate my palms backwards, I'm no longer in anatomic position, but also my own and my radius have crossed over each other. They cross over. So if you look at my, nomen, my, my uh, verbiage here, when you pronate, that is you medially, right, I'm medially rotating my arm, right, it's going inward. 
If I immediately rotate my arm inward, I'm undergoing pronation, and my ulna crosses over the radius. Now, if I go from pronation, and now I now laterally turn my arms, that is now supination. My radius and ulna are now back to parallel. And the way I remember it, to get my supper, I need to supinate. Right? So if I'm going to get my food, I'm going to have my palms forward. So supination, right? bringing my palms outward again, if you will. And so in that supination, the, you're returning back to AP, back to anatomic position, and the ulna is now, is now uh, parallel with the radius. Protraction and retraction. Protraction is putting your body more anteriorly. So in a horizontal plane, sticking your chin up, basically. We protraction and retraction, pulling it back in. Opposition, right? We have opposable thumbs. Opposition is the ability for you to take your thumb and put it across your palm. Lower primates can't do that, right? So we have opposable thumbs. And the opposite of that is reposition. So opposition is to pull it in front. To reposition it is to put it back. I don't have that term on there. So opposition and reposition. So pictures are here for us. Uh, again, if you're going to rotate or pivot, you can see that here. Um, a lot of our body joints have lots of movement within them. So you might be able to exhibit multiple movements in one place. But rotation or pivot moving along a, an axis. You can pivot your leg right up at your hip, right? And, and it's all part of that acetabulum. But I can pivot my leg right along the long axis. Then there's a depression, elevation. Again, if you can just see very simply, depression is going downward, elevation is going up. Dorsiflexion, toes pointing upward. All right, so at your ankle, toes pointing upward, that's dorsiflexion, and doing toe point down, that is plantar flexion. To invert or to evert, so to move the sole of your foot outward or invert it inwardly. Supination and pronation, again, I, I think it's easier just to just think about supper. So bringing your arm around back to anatomic position so that such that your palm is facing outward. Your radius and your ulna are now once again in um, anatomic position. So in supination, ulna and radius would be parallel. In pronation, they're crossing over. Uh, protraction, away from some sort of anterior movement, retraction, pulling it back. And then again, uh, oppositional thumb, and the, op the uh, opposite term of that is re to reposition the thumb. Opposition and reposition. So just know those other little uh, body movements. I would be asking you to pick out what it is. So if I said to you, you're sitting on a couch, and uh, during the movie, you raise your arm and put it on the back of the couch. What have you done with your arm? And there'd be X, Y, Z, right? A, B, C, D. So what have you done? Bringing the arm out, you've abducted, right? Um, if you were um, going to go to the water fountain in the garden and cup your fingers tightly to capture water, what have you done with your fingers? You brought them in closer to the midline, so that would be adduction. Okay, so again, I'd be describing a, a common movement, and you would have to know which body movement I'm describing. So that's how I would quiz you or test you on those types of activities. In the old days, when I was teaching at a smaller school, I would have people go out in the hallway and show me these body movements, but I just don't have enough time during the exam to have you all dance for me in the hallway. So we'll, we'll skip that formality this semester. Okay. The next, I don't know, 20 slides, maybe more, are just sort of a kick back and watch and listen, uh, walk through through some joint spaces. Now, I've only got about a minute or so here, about five minutes, but I'll start with this. And the only things you really want to focus on in these slides is knowing where is this joint and what bones are involved and are there any bone markings from our list that are involved. And I'll pick up with this. Let me go through a couple of them. And then we'll, we'll zoom through this very, very quickly. You're not responsible for any of the extra ligaments or tendons or anything beyond what we learned in lab, right? The muscles, the bones, the bone markings. That's what you need to know. 
If you hear about the TMJ, though, for example, this is the temporomandibular joint, right? This is between the, what? Yeah, sort of your chewing uh, joint, right? So this is between um, the temporal bone and your mandible. And it's very loose. It's actually two synovial joints together. I mean, you can chew up and down, but you can also go side to side, all right? You got a lot of chewing, a lot of motion in your jaw. Well, with that mobility comes a lot of instability. So a lot of people have issues with their TMJ. There's a lot of movement that creates some problems. It's one of those things that's more common in women than men. It's also a thing where if people get adult orthodontia, they can be fine, and then when they're shifting those teeth around, you'll create TMJ problems that weren't there before. So sometimes ugly teeth are worth keeping. Um, don't tell your orthodontist I said that, but that's, that's the way it is, right? So here's what I want you to do when you're looking. I'll, I'll walk you through these slides, right? But if you want to get ahead and you want to start thinking, what do you want me to do here? As you walk through these slides, think about bone markings. So what we see here, here's that double joint. The white is cartilage, right? So you've got cartilage, and you've got bones with cartilage on them. And let's name some bone markings. This is the styloid process. We get that. It's marked. This opening is the external auditory meatus. And this going over, it'd be part of the mastoid process. Okay, over here. We're all part of the temporal bone, aren't we? And the, the blue is fluid. The blue areas here are fluid. The white is the actual cartilage that creates the joint space. And that's really what I want you to appreciate as you look through these pictures, right? Now, last picture on the TMJ. We, we, we lose tr track of this, but that styloid process, isn't it cute? There's a little ligament that attaches to it and goes down to your mandible. I mean, every little bump and groove and hole in your bones is there for some reason. And, and you don't have to name that ligament, but isn't it cool to know that there's a little reason for that little styloid process, a little ligament attaches to it. And again, we've already named the external auditory meatus. And the other thing I want you to appreciate is that all these joints are well protected and well maintained and structurally kept by lots of ligaments. And we're not naming the ligaments here, but you can't even see the bones because of all the ligaments that are protecting that area, not to mention the muscles that would be sitting on top of all this as well, helping to also stabilize those joint spaces. So that's where we'll stop today. Uh, the, the, the rest of this, we've got a little bit, after we get through these muscles, and uh, after we get through these joints, there's just a few slides after all this, talking about fractures and how bones go back together. And that'll finish up our conversation about joints and bones completely. And then we'll have about, uh, about an hour and a half or so of muscle talk. And that'll be all that will be on the, first, on the next exam. So it's just going to be bones, joints, and muscles on the exam next week. And your lab exam has already helped you get pretty ready for that. So come up and see me if you have any questions.